Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Ibarra. I'm president of the Banning Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 State of the City. changed that up because we figured that given where we are right now in the country this would be a good thing to start with today so let us bow our heads and, and have a word of prayer first I'm mindful that I was going to call upon the Holy Spirit but I think given the wind situation out there the Holy Spirit's already with us so for which we are grateful Heavenly Father in your word you have given us a vision of that holy city to which the nations of the world bring their glory. Behold and visit, we pray, the cities of the earth, especially this beautiful city of Banning, California. Renew the ties of mutual regard which form our civic life. Send us honest and able leaders. Enable and endow our mayor, our city council, and all elected and appointed officials with clear vision to see where we have been, where we are, and where we need to go. Enable us to eliminate poverty, prejudice, and oppression. That peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order. That men and women from different cultures and with different talents may find with one another the fulfillment their humanity as they live in this, and work in this beautiful place. All this and more, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'm Doug Schultz. I'm the city manager for the city of Banning. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday, I was able to celebrate my one-year anniversary with the city. So... Thank you. As I look back over that year, it just seems to be a blur. Um, so much has happened, and, and I think what, as we go through the program here and you hear from uh, council members and members of the management team, you'll see um, it, it has been quite a year. Um, not only at a professional level, but a personal level, as I had uh, two kids get married, new grandbaby born about uh, two and a half months ago now, and uh, it's kind of interesting, funny story. This is my, my second son, middle, middle child's first child, and uh, when his wife went into labor, he calls the doctor and says, my wife's in, or, she's in labor and, and the contractions are a minute and a half apart. And he's all excited, and he's yelling at the nurse, and, and she goes, sir, sir, is, is this the first child? And he goes, no, I'm the father. <laughs> so 
So again, I'd like, like to thank you all for, um, for taking the time out of your day to be here. Uh, we'll move into the program now. We're gonna just do this a little different. Um, we, we have, we're going to have Mayor Welch come up and uh, say a few words. Uh, we'll follow that by Mayor Pro Tem uh, Andrade, and uh, then I'll turn it back over to me. You couldn't ask for a better cheerleader. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Doug asked me to say a few words, so thank you all for coming. <laughs> you know, he was, I'm gonna take a little uh, privilege here for a second, but uh, Doug introduced all of the uh, dignitaries uh, here today. I'm sure we missed some, but everyone's welcome. But there's one dignitary here that I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce, and it also be in a lot of trouble when I got home. So I'd like to introduce my wife, Jody. In February of this year, members of the city council, the city manager, and the city's management team met to discuss our strategic strategic goals and objectives. Our strategic planning session started with a tour of our city, parks and facilities, capital projects, and private developments. Following the tour, we gathered together in a conference room at the police department to talk about our strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities, and threats. Ultimately, we identified a long list of goals and objectives, a list that was much too long to serve as a focused strategic plan. So in April, the City Council reviewed the long list of goals and created a prioritized list of objectives. These objectives were then categorized and serve as the strategic direction given to the city manager. And shortly, you'll be hearing from the city manager who will be providing more detail about our strategic plan and the results that we are seeking. It's no secret that the city of Banning has a substantial budget problem to resolve during our next biennial uh, budget process. The good news is that with several new projects underway, both property tax and sales tax revenues will see growth during the foreseeable future. We're very excited that Party Homes will soon start construction on model homes at the Atwell Project. And during the first quarter of 2020, we can expect permits to be issued on approximately 500 homes. Governor Newsom and our state legislators has expressed strong interest in, uh, in addressing home, home affordability in California. While this is a worthy goal, it is not as simple as just building more homes. We need jobs that will support new homeowners or we will just be putting more people on the overcrowded highways and freeways. We need developers who are willing to invest in our communities. Cities aren't in the development business. We need builders and tradespeople to actually construct the new homes. Finally, we need businesses to support the new residents of our communities. Now, as we prepare for new homes and new businesses, we are not ignoring the need for mobility. Several significant projects are in various stages of development. These projects include everything from sidewalks, bicycle lanes, transit improvements, to major projects such as, and I know a lot in the audience want to hear this one, such as 
Highland Springs I-10 interchange and the Sun Lakes Boulevard extension. Your city council representatives who sit on regional boards and committees are working hard to move regional projects with the pass area forward. The regional funds that are available fall short, far short of meeting the Inland Empire infrastructure needs. So it's important that we continue to fight hard for the project funding, especially with the Riverside County. And I know that we have some champions there for the pass area. The Banning City Council for many years has had a desire to, to revitalize the downtown area. Our downtown area uh, exists between I-10 and William Street from Hargrave to 8th Avenue. This is 27 square blocks that has tremendous potential to be a thriving economic energy. So at this time, I would like to introduce and invite up Mayor Pro Tem Daniela Andretti to give you an update on the work she and our downtown ad hoc committee have been doing to revitalize our downtown as well as the work on the Healthy Cities Initiative. Daniela. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here and hearing uh, the wonderful things that our city has done. I've been elected to the city council about two and a half years ago, and ever since I've gotten on, one of my main goals, together with, at a time, uh, Councilwoman Debbie Franklin, was to create a healthy city here. In, the, in, in our beautiful city of Banning. What we have done is we did uh, surveys of the community to see exactly what they're interested with. We have uh, collaborated and partnered up with several community groups as well as the, wanna definitely give a, a thank you to Loma Linda Hospital who's always involved in our community. And, uh, <laughs> So what we brought forth was um, started two years ago, so we already have, oh, um, we are proceeding and going on um, the third year coming in February. Uh, the 5K run and walk uh, together with other activities that will thrive and um, create more of a healthy community. We also want to put together some uh, nutritional values and what to eat, what not to eat, and um, just do some workouts and um, get the community together. I do want to definitely welcome Juanita Diaz, who is our newest member of our committee for the Healthy Cities, and she already started all the walks in the park and um, initiated several things that she already put out there. Uh, our committee is um, together with Councilwoman Colleen Wallace, we're sitting on the Healthy Cities, as well as um, our ad hoc committee for the downtown together with the chamber. And I do want to thank Robert Ibarra for always showing up and supporting us. Uh, but the initiative for our uh, ad hoc committee at the downtown ad hoc committee, together with Councilwoman Colleen Wallace, we uh, have created um, the general area, as Mr. Um, Art Welsh, Amir, already uh, said. And what we want to do is just beautify downtown Banning and beautify Banning as a whole. We have looked into maybe putting some mirrors up on the walls, um, on buildings, uh, together with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we have several empty properties right in the center of downtown. We would like to, um, our vision is of course to maybe create a small park where everybody can enjoy our downtown and uh, have maybe some security walking around, you know, making people feel safe, inviting, have everybody come out, creating some alleyways with uh, flowers and plants and some sitting areas and some shade where people can actually walk and enjoy a beautiful downtown. So um, with that, I do want to thank you and I look forward to everything else that we have to offer. And I invite all of you to please come and enjoy our city and walk through our downtown and See our local businesses. So one of the uh, 
hallmarks of a, a strong city is, is uh, the, the quality of the schools within the city. And um, although this may be a little unusual, they have, have a school district member come up and, and talk about the quality of schools and what the schools are doing. Uh, we felt it was important because we, we want a strong partnership with the school district and have been working hard to develop that partnership uh, in the past year. So I'd like to invite uh, Superintendent Robert Gian to come up and uh, make a few remarks about what's happening with the Banning Unified School District. As the city grows and improves, the district has to improve also. If the city does expand and the growth does come in, the district needs to be ready for it. So we're starting to do a master plan and I'd just like to just go over that a little bit with everybody here. One of the things that we're looking at is maybe going back to K6, 7, 8 for middle school, and then 9, 12 for high school. But again, then right now, the district is 6, 7, and 8 in middle school. We'd like to go back to a junior high kind of setting, 7 and 8. We have to be ready for the growth. And one of the areas we need to really grow in is in the high school. Hope you can see the pointer. The high school is this right here right now. The district has purchased all this property to 8th Street to expand. We're working with the developer that's coming here to purchase another 14 to 16 acres over in here. So we're master planning the high school to eventually be able to house 2,000 to 3,000 students. And we already started that right here is we have a fine arts facility with an auditorium and stage and all the riggings that go with that to do seat, I should say, 700 individuals. You don't have nothing like that in the past area that can hold that many people. Also to the side of it is multimedia, um, classrooms, and also fine arts classrooms back here. The one thing that we're talking about, we don't have a labor force around here for construction. Right in here is coming an academy for construction. We teamed up with the Carpenters Union. They basically train 80, 90% of the trades. So welding, plumbing, electrical, and all those to build these beautiful buildings, they train. And hopefully, our students at the end of four years come out with the journeyman level trade. Those students are probably going to be able to go into the workforce and probably by the time they get out of high school and go into the Carpenters Union, they could be making anywhere from 26 to $40 an hour with benefits and all those things. We need that. Right now, if you ask anybody out there in construction trade, we are short on the labor force. I think we need to start training our people to be able to build things. Right now, we want to start an industry in Banning. It's going to be hard. We don't have the labor force, the trained labor force. So hopefully, our students will be able to come out with some skills out of the high school. Right in here, we're looking at probably going some ag area. Maybe right in here, we're talking kind of nursery kind of area. In here, maybe even sod, growing sod. And, and over here, we want to add more fields for like our band to practice on, soccer, and those types of things. And maybe we'll have some ag buildings right in here. This is a potential elementary. If, our developer comes in, we want to put an elementary here. Where we're that. Right now, that's just in the beginning stages. We'll work on that more. But again, you're looking at increasing all this area now is going to be educational. You're talking over 80 acres usable. And we're also working with the flood um, departments to kind of Get rid of that ditch that's there. You guys know that beautiful ditch, right? It's really nice. It's beautiful. 
I never heard of, of a, such of a ditch being next to a high school, not in my planning days. Nicolette, right now it's sixth, seventh, and eighth. We want to change that to seven and eight and start planning that to really use all this property wisely. And we have property over here also to the east. Maybe we want to connect that. Again, we want this to be able to house around 15 to 2,000 students. Central, in the morning. Has anybody ever passed Central in the morning? Is that a really a nice place to be with your car? No. Again, that school was probably built when there was hardly any cars on the road. So, we need to expand. We're purchasing property here right now, probably purchase some more. And this is one option that we're planning on. This would be a two-story building to get rid of all the portables that are at that site and make it into a permanent two-story building. If, if you have been to Hopper, they have plenty of portable, correct? We need to get rid of those portables. We want to go with permanent, take place of portable buildings. Okay, what you saw is getting rid of portables. Now we're going to have to look at expanding to go to K-6, but now they're K-5. And some of the schools range from 400 students all the way up to 600. We want to go ahead and master plan these schools to be able to go to 800 students. That means more buildings to go in, but we want to make sure we keep the play areas. As the mayor has mentioned during his, uh, in his comments, um, we, we held a strategic planning session earlier this year that resulted in a fairly extensive list of goals and objectives that uh, have been identified. So when the council gave us the, the marching orders, basically, we got together as a staff and started looking at how we can categorize the different goals and objectives. And we came up with what we're calling five pillars of success for banning. You could probably apply those five pillars to any city. Is it, what city doesn't want to be safe? What city doesn't want to have a vibrant economy? But it's how we define those different pillars that are unique to, to our community. I, I want to just kind of set the stage of, of what we're trying to do and what each of those pillars mean. And then um, as a way to help you get to know our management team because 90% of the team is brand new. Um, each of the team members are going to come up and talk specifically about what's happening in their department and how that applies to our pillars of success. So the diverse economy, pretty, pretty straightforward. We want to collaborate with our local organizations, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's the Rotary Club. Um, we have a number of different organizations, both on the public and private side. Um, and we're building strong partnerships with those organizations. Developing programs to build a positive image of the city. It's one of the most important things we can do is build that positive image of Banning. Uh, one of the things I heard when, when I first got here is a lot of talk about the, the image of the community, the image of the downtown. So we want to work really hard to change that. And um, you may have heard Count, um, Mayor Pro Tem Andrade last meeting talked about um, having a discussion in the future about branding and about the city logo. That, that all plays into that. Leveraging city and surrounding area attractions. The pass area it, it ha has all kinds of activities and attractions to bring people to the area, whether it's the outlet malls, whether it's Highland Springs Ranch, whether it's Gilman Springs Ranch, um, Idlewild, we, the, the whole area is, is filled with activities. And we shouldn't be exclusive looking to bring people just to Banning. We need to be looking at the region and being partners with our neighboring cities. Because we all benefit when, when we bring people to the area. And then uh, use of city-owned assets to maximize return on the investment. The city owns a lot of land. 
We own a lot of property in our downtown and throughout the community. Uh, we need to make sure that we have good plans in place for how we're going to use those properties to, get the, to make sure it's the highest and best use. Of course, a safe city. A lot of times when we think about safe city, we think about police and fire. But there are a lot, a lot more aspects to, to being a safe city. Certainly we want to be well prepared and have adequate staff in our police department and with our fire services. But we also want to make sure we're effectively manning our, managing our resources, our water resources, our land, our open areas. We want to promote safe and secure neighborhoods and businesses by encouraging community-based programs and facilitating vigorous law enforcement. We've added, and I, I think the chief will talk about this, we've added um, some additional code enforcement officers. Uh, they're getting up and running on their feet, and um, it's certainly an area we need to pay more attention to. The li reliable infrastructure and connected mobility. Again, there's a theme here. A lot of partnerships, whether it's with our neighboring cities, whether it's within organizations within the city, or state and county level. This is about providing not only the infrastructure, our, our streets and our water and sewer, um, but it's also transit. It's also making, you've, you've probably seen the bike lanes that went in on Ramsey, making sure that we have safe, safe areas for pedestrians and motorists alike. Connected mobility also includes communication, making sure that we're communicating with the community, making sure the community has access to um, as, as free of internet services as we can create here. And then quality of life. Beautification of the city through public improvements and code enforcement. Creating and preserving access to open space, parks and recreational opportunities, and developing, um, preserving and revitalizing residential neighborhoods that are safe, attractive, and accessible to public trans transportation and provide diverse, affordable housing options. We want to make sure we're connecting housing to transportation improvements. And then finally, but also very important, good governance. Probably more appropriate to, to call it good government. Because we're looking at regular and ongoing communication with employees, with the residents of the community and with the businesses in the community. We want to make sure we're being fiscally responsive, responsible, that we're being transparent, and that we're measuring our performance. My city manager colleagues in, in the room will, will know that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's important and it's something that with our next budget cycle, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see what we're doing to measure our performance and report that back to the community. So some of the things we've, we've also implemented um, that fall into the housing and economic development category is, is housing programs. City launched programs in September of 2018. Um, we've appropriated roughly $700,000 over a two-year budget for housing programs. The fo focus those programs on assisting existing homeowners and prospective buyers. It's income qualifications, program guidelines, and applications available on the city website. One of the things we're really proud of is that our applicant approval success rate is near 70%. In the recent success story, Habitat, hum for, um, Habitat for Humanity at 1323 East Christie Street. For those of you that were able to, um, yes. For those of you that were able to attend the, um, the, um, I guess, key exchange, maybe um, <clears throat> it was a very nice celebration. A lot of community members showed up, and uh, we were able to um, provide a home to a new family in the community. Uh, it was very rewarding, and I'm sure for those that were deeply involved, uh, extremely rewarding. Continuing with the housing programs, uh, rehabilitation and energy efficiency funds um, 
we want to preserve the existing housing in inventory because obviously that's one of the ways that we can uh, try to keep housing affordability uh, down. Uh, we also have programs we offer through the electric department, including an audit, a grant program, and forgivable, forgivable loans of $5,000 up to $10,000. We also have a first-time homebuyer program that provides 1% or up to uh, $20,000 for down payment. Business attraction uh, with focus on commercial and retail right now. We have some new, new tenants, also the recent expansion of Diamond Hills Chevrolet, working on um, expanding the number of franchises that are at that dealership. Uh, we welcome new tenants, Waba Grill, Altura Credit Union, Buffalo Spot, and Leslie, Leslie's Pool Supply. We've seen uh, sales tax growth of 33% over the last four years. And as of the fiscal year 18-19, we've finally reached that point where the city has received full re or reached full recovery from the losses for, uh, through the depression or recession. So you, you, you can see that Banning has kind of struggled catching up to where it was pre-recession. Uh, we have other retailers we've been uh, in conversation with, including PetSmart, Blink Fitness, Chevrolet, uh, Grocery Outlet, and Arby's. And as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Andrade mentioned, we are also focusing on our downtown area, uh, commercial redevelopment within the downtown. The former San Gorgonio Insight, directly across from City Hall on Ramsey Street, uh, we recently uh, um, put out an RFP for development of that property. It happens to be city owned, it's about five and a half acres. What's really cool about a property like this when the city owns it is that the city council can actually control what happens with that property. So through the RFP process, we actually will be accepting uh, submittals for development. We'll have a public process to review those submittals and a lot of public input in terms of what that property looks like when it's developed. And that, that process, um, the, the submittals will, uh, deadline is the, the end of this month, and we'll start right into the process of reviewing that and, and having public input uh, in November. We also have community development block grant program. Um, that program is currently out for uh, proposals. It's a federally funded program for those that you don't know, locally administered. Um, the intent is, is um, programs and projects that improve the quality of life in the community. Uh, this funding cycle we figure will have about $185,000. And uh, some of the past projects the city has dedicated that funding to is the community center rehab and Dysart Park fencing and, and concessions building. Good afternoon, Banning and friends of Banning. All right, make sure you're awake. Well, let's see. Let's see if I can hit a home run with the uh, two-handed deal here. Good governance and good government really go hand in hand. And by the way, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So I am one month in to Banning, celebrating my uh, one month anniversary, along with Doug's one year anniversary. <laughs> But I have 18 years worth of background in municipal law and municipal finance. I have spent my entire professional career since graduating from law school and business school at USC. Any Trojans in the house? All right. And by the way, my undergrad was at UCLA. Any Bruins in the house? There we go. Covering all my bases. Oh, anyway, very committed um, after 18 years in public service to good government and good governance. I do not know the person that provided this quote, but it spoke to me as I was looking for an introductory statement. And I think it speaks volumes to what it really means to be in service to the public and what we owe to the public as public servants. With that, administrative services, often referred to or thought of as the finance department critically important, but there are a number of things that we manage, handle, so that the city runs well. 
including finance, that's finance and budget, and I'd like to acknowledge my core team over here, Suzanne Cook and Stacy Boslog. Thank you. Purchasing. We want to be a business-friendly community. We also want to get best quality goods and services at the best price. That's where our mighty purchasing team comes in. And um, I will uh, acknowledge them by name a little bit later. We're going to do a little spotlight on all of the great things that purchasing has been doing in the last year and will be doing in the upcoming year. Utility billing and customer support. This is our one opportunity to really look out and interface with the community. And yes, that goes for my customer service reps in the back that take your calls, handle your payments, answer your questions, and solve your problems, as well as my field reps. George, Todd, did Todd make today too? The guys that are out there making sure that things are working, things are getting read, and really helping you out on a day-to-day -day basis. IT, we really couldn't do much of anything without IT. There is a fantastic team that we have. And by the way, we'll highlight a couple of the initiatives that we've uh, undertaken in that regard. And human resources, what would we do without human resources? So really, this uh, group of folks is working quietly, diligently, and earnestly behind the scenes um, to safeguard all of your financial resources and really making sure that all of our other city departments have the support and the resources they need so that you get the services that you need. Okay, big picture. A few things that we've accomplished, and I'm very proud of these things, um, as well as some upcoming initiatives that really speak to the open communication that Doug mentioned, the transparency that Doug mentioned, the performance measurement that Doug mentioned that really underlies good government and good governance and an engaged and informed decision-making body and citizenry. Bond refinancing. Um, we definitely have financial challenges ahead of us. Most public agencies across the United States do. That being said, we just on Tuesday took our final steps to be able to close a bond refunding or refinancing on our wastewater bonds that will save the city and ultimately the citizens a little over $100,000 a year. So the bond market has been favorable for us and we took advantage of that. Electric utility audit. That was a project that uh, with over the course of the year um, we brought home that on Tuesday as well, and there were definitely some findings that we can draw on to be able to improve upon the experience that folks have and be able to ultimately operate our electric utility in a more efficient fashion, as well as our utility billing and customer support functions. Yes, Accounting system updates. Um, this is one of the things I was talking about with IT. I am happy to tell you that within that first month, I'd have to consider this one a home run, just by engaging all of my managers across the department, as well as my IT team, um, we are able to implement a significant updates to our accounting system at no additional cost. How about that? was already covered in what we're paying for our maintenance. Financial transparency. It's not in the, this, these are not ordered in uh, order of importance, but financial transparency, this is really moving into what we're looking forward to. And I would have to consider this one of our cornerstone initiatives in terms of outreach to the public and really opening up that communication channel so that we have good flow of communication and availability and access to information for our public, all of our financial information. You will be able to now access past and current budgets in real time, at home, at, in the morning, at night, whenever you'd like to. That promotes an informed public, and that promotes an engaged public, because we are here to serve you. Um, and I will uh, give a little bit of a preview of what that looks like. For uh, those of you that are in government, OpenGov 
has been an initiative that's been really, you know, rolled out over a number of jurisdictions. And so you will hear it either as financial transparency portal, that's what I call it, or open gov. In addition, by the way, um, we will be holding a couple of education sessions for the public in advance of our budget hearings. Again, to promote not only uh, use of the tool, but having that engaged conversation with the public, kind of an ed ed education on public finance um, concept. The adoption of, I love this one. We're a Kupka city now. Congratulations to purchasing on that one. So that means that the state has formally approved uh, the city of Banning to become, uh, uh, to be beholden to or under the California Uniform Public Construction Cost Accounting Act. From now on, just Cupka City will do. Cybersecurity enhancements, another accomplishment and ongoing initiative um, with our information technology group and truly important Yes, as you see time and time again, uh, jurisdictions falling prey to hackers and um, uh, having their systems uh, taken over and you know, things like ransomware. Cost allocation study. In other words, um, having a reliable um, and uh, defensible cost allocation plan and this is getting a little wonky and into the weeds in terms of uh, accounting, but the city of Banning is in the process right now of completing its first cost allocation plan. I am familiar with this kind of uh, plan, having done one or participated in one for the last 18 years. So frankly, I have to congratulate the current council and staff for having the vision to get a cost allocation plan uh, going. And we will be happy that we can include that as part of our rate studies, rate structures, and upcoming budget for the next two fiscal years. Finally, um, we recently, prior to me coming on board, um, we uh, went out for RFP and continued, decided to continue our relationship with Wells Fargo. As a result of that RFP process and discussions with Wells Fargo, we will be receiving a significantly enhanced level of service. And a couple of the things that I really want to touch upon um, are the business process reviews. In other words, for no additional cost. I'm big on free stuff, by the way. Never pay full price. Um, business process reviews mean that we are going to have the banks professional experts come in and basically do business reviews for us and document our processes and help us identify where we are, where we have inefficiencies so we can remove those from process. Um, commercial payment programs. This is another one. This is an opportunity for banning to be saving money or making money, getting money back on its expenditures. Kind of like your cash back credit cards but apply that concept to a city level and utilizing the data we have on our vendors and, um, and actual expenditure data, um, that's a pretty powerful um, savings or revenue source for the city that has been untapped to date. So really excited about that coming in in the next six months. This is the OpenGov or Financial Transparency Portal. So just a quick shot of what your interface will look like. You'll, have a home, you'll go to the home page. Anybody can do this. You can do this from anywhere, anytime around the world at your convenience. And the idea, again, is transparency. This is your financial data. So access it whenever you like and participate in your local government. From your home page or on your home page, We'll have a number of areas that you can drill down on and really get into the financial detail. Um, and this is just, these are a couple of examples of areas that tend to be of significant interest to folks. So from here, for instance, you would click on the picture under general fund revenues and expenditures, and you would able, be able to see 
all of the budgeted general fund revenues and expenditures for a particular budget year um, by fund, or you can drill down and continue, continue to drill down by project and program. Um, you can um, also get actual data for actual revenues and expenditures, like a financial statement, for any years that have been audited and closed. Truly powerful if you're a finance geek like me, and even if you're not. Public safety, everybody wants to know, how much are we spending on public safety? What are the programs that public safety is engaged in? Where is the money coming from? What are the revenue sources that fund public safety? That's the kind of information you'll be able to get here. You wanna know how much is the contract for with CAL FIRE? That would be here, this is where we would go for that. Uh, you know, what are we spending on vehicles? Um, all of those kind of capital, capital projects that are associated with public safety, that would be here. Capital projects itself tends to be, obviously, a large and uh, important area of interest for public, uh, public agencies. These are the roads and the water systems and the electric utility systems that touch our lives every single day, morning, noon, and night, 365 days a year. By the way, side note, that is one of the things I find most interesting and engaging about working in local government, and it's why, it's not why I got into public service and local government, but it's why I've stayed 18 years later. Okay, moving on. I mentioned I was going to do a little spotlight on one of our divisions, and that's purchasing. So, um, as I was asking folks, you know, about their goals and accomplishments, it turns out, and by the way, let's see here. So this here, our purchasing manager, Shiloh, our team is at Shiloh, Tisha, and Lily. Do you guys want to stand up and get a little uh, acknowledgement from the crowd? They have really done some incredible things. And this year, 2019, they received the Award of Excellence um, in Procurement. Turns out this wasn't the first year they received the award. This is the second year. And it's not really a big surprise to me because in just the last year, um, we, they have, of course, uh, managed to get us adopted as a Kupka, uh, Kupka City, uh, implemented DocuSign, which meant that the transaction times on um, uh, documents has been shortened, much more efficient process, time is money, um, done, uh, reached out to the departments in order to assist them and provide great support and improve on our efficiency by providing trainings and they're gonna build on that experience and not only do that within um, the city and our departments, but also reach outward. Um, and that Kupka process, by the way, is, I mentioned business friendly, it's efficient and it promotes, um, it's efficient for the vendors. It's easier for the vendors and for the departments to get into contract and get through their contracting process. Um, the credit card purchasing program, also that's the same thing as the Wells Fargo um, purchase program. Purchasing is a big part of that initiative. They were also a big part of that RFP process that brought us this uh, program that's going to bring in money or keep the money back in the city. Um, Procure Now is a portal for uh, vendors as well and our departments that will also significantly approve upon the efficiency for bidding and contracting. So at Banning Electric, we have two jobs. Okay, you can all watch the uh, NFL football. Come on, man, you had one job to do. Well, we've got two. First job we do is we use all your collective load and go out and buy power and take advantage of the stress that our loads, uh, the loads provide for us. And we buy power and we bring it home. And then the second thing we have to do is we have to get into your house and keep, keep the lights on. So that's the two jobs that, that we do. Uh, for you every okay, so, and, and Doug has talked about, too, that, that we have these five pillars of a strong community. Well, what also helps, up the, helps hold the building up is strong cornerstones. And the most important cornerstone for public is safety and my linemen. And uh, I like to send my linemen home every single day. Uh, and so we have commandments for safety 
And I can tell you in my 35 year career, I've been blessed to be able to send every single one of them home every single night. And that's a really, really important thing in our industry. Okay, I get to brag a little bit. Uh, every year we participate in uh, surveys for reliability. And the last survey that we participated in was for 2017. The data for 2018 is coming. But what's really important for reli is reliability. You like it when your lights turn on, you hit your switch, it's on and it's there. Um, so we have three really major indices. Frequency is the F in safety. Duration is the D in SADI. And duration is the D in KD. Frequency means our system has had 17% chance of, of having an outage. And it puts us in the, is in the number one decile, meaning your lights are always on. And I'm very proud of that, that our crews are able to keep lights on for you. That means 99% of the rest of the world have more outages than you do. When you do have an outage, it's for about 23 minutes. And that's, that's the length of the outage, of uh, the duration piece. And once again, in 2017, that put us in the number one percentile. Not very many people can beat us. When we have an outage for the customer, the average customer will be out for 136 minutes. Um, that's put us, that's about in the middle of, of the range. Um, but, and it's the one place we have to improve on, and the way we're gonna improve on that, that uh, indice is, is to automate our system, and that's something that will be coming soon. So, one of the things that we've been working on very diligently, and it's gonna cause and impact our reliability numbers, is our conversion on the east side of Banning because Councilwoman Colleen Wallace told me she needs more juice. <laughs> so, uh, we've got quite a little bit of work going on over on the east side of Banning where we're replacing uh, poles, wires, and transformers in order to provide more electricity in preparation for any growth that would happen on the east side of Banning. Then we have our relationships with our, with our two large uh, housing developments that's causing us to be able to expand our system and build reliability into the future. We are working with Part E every single day right now. So we're, we're working with Part E right now, and this is, the, this is Highland Springs going up the west side, and this is Wilson. Uh, this is their first major phase for construction, and we're working with them hand in hand to put a, a brand new uh, power system in in order to serve the homes in that area. And as well, Diversified is working on uh, Rancho San Gregorio, and their first section will be right over here, which is just south and west of the high school, and we'll be starting construction on new power lines in that area as well. Wildfire mitigation has become a, a daily occurrence. This is the map for the pass area. The red is what is called tier three, where it is, is most likely for a wildfire to start. The yellow is tier two. The white is commercial areas or, or um, corporation areas like and here's Beaumont and here is Banning. As you can see, they are not in the wildfire threat area, but the power lines are. And one of the most important things and the message I need to get out for folks here in the city of Banning is when you see warning for El Casco, that's the likelihood that the city of Banning will be out of power. Otherwise, if you don't, see, you don't see El Casco, we're not on the fire threat area. And it's again, because we're, we're down on the valley floor and we have our own utility and we're served separately. Um, and we don't have a lot of influence from the power lines that Edison uses to serve the rural areas around our community. So some of the information Tom did not share with you that um, you may be interested in, and we were, were very proud of. The uh, Banning Electric Utility is running at about 70% renewable, which far exceeds the state requirements uh, that we, we reach, 30%. Uh, um, and the, the other, really cool thing about that for the ratepayers is that about 85% of electric ratepayers in California pay more than the ratepayers in Banning. So we far exceed the, the requirements for renewable energy and we're doing it cheaper.
So congratulations to Tom and his, his group. Next up, we have Public Works Director Art Bella. Thank you, Doug. And welcome, everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. I appreciate you showing up today and supporting our city. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Art Bella. I'm the Public Works Director and City Engineer for the City of Banning. And I want to uh, come today uh, with a presentation to highlight some of the things that we've done this year to meet that goal of reliable, reliable infrastructure and, and connectivity. And, and while I do this, and before I start, I, I, wanna, I wanna let you know that we don't have a lot of staff in our department. Um, and we cover a lot of areas. We do building maintenance, we do fleet, we've got, we got water and wastewater, we have an airport, uh, we're handling all of our land development projects, um, we've got streets, and, and we, we, although we don't have a lot of staff, I really feel um, truly that we have the right people doing the right jobs. And although a lot of my staff members were not able to show up today, I do want to recognize Luis Gardenas and Kevin Sin, who are my uh, senior engineers. And Paul. <laughs> Holly Stewart, who is the management analyst in the Public Works Department, she's kind of our utility player and handles a lot of complicated projects. Um, and lastly, I want to recognize Chris Thornton, uh, Jerry Molidor, and our new uh, employee who just started, and your name already left me, I apologize. <laughs> but they, were, they work for our collections uh, division, and these guys, for the last a couple of years, they've won the small collection systems of the year, which is a very difficult accolade to give, but they have gotten it several times, and so thank you very much for your service to us. Um, so, so we're going to start with, with street infrastructure. Um, in 2018, we completed a project, uh, a street rehabilitation project, at a budget of $782,000. And with that funding, we were able to complete one and a half miles of pavement rehabilitation and filled in approximately 176 potholes. Um, this year, we have a similar project uh, with a larger budget of $1,463,000. Um, we plan on rehabbing four miles of, uh, of street pavement and filling in approximately 100 potholes. And, and that sounds like a lot going on. In two years, we'll be able to handle five and a half miles. But the re reality is that we have 250 miles of street, net of street roads in our network. Um, we've, we've been able to double our budget um, for uh, street rehab capital projects um, by the passing of SB1. And I know SB1 didn't have a lot of fans, um, and I'm not here to speak about that, but it has done wonders for the money that's available to help us um, resurface our roads. And um, what that does, though, it makes it very critical for us to assure that we're spending our money where it needs to be spent. And so we do um, detailed analysis on the roads that we're going to improve. We look at rideability, we look at the uh, surface condition, and we look at the average amount of traffic on the roads. And so when you see us doing projects out there, those, those projects have been vetted before we begin to spend money. And critical to, to projects like this is grant funding. We're always seeking grant funding. There's a lot of money out there. Some grants are competitive, some are gimmies, but, but we go out for as many projects as we can. And a perfect example of that is a, a project that we recently completed that Doug had mentioned, which is the active transportation uh, plant project. And so we were able to acquire a million dollar grant um, to do the design and construction um, of some street improvements, including the installation of six miles of bike lanes along Ramsey and San Gregonio. Um, and that also helped fund several handicap ramps fronting our schools on uh, uh, near Central and going north of, of Highland, or sorry, of uh, San Gregonio. Uh, another highly uh, talked about project um, is the Highland Springs Interchange. We all know the Highland Springs Interchange um, is not operating at an acceptable level. Um, we recently uh, presented a, an agreement to our city council, and which was approved, and it's an agreement with the Riverside County Transportation Commission. Um, this agreement is between Banning, RCTC, and the city of Beaumont, and the objective of this agreement is for RCTC to complete what's called a project study report. All interchange projects have to do a project study report, and it's that initial phase of an analyzing all the different alternatives um, to make sure that we're selecting the right one. And so in this analysis, we'll look at the, um, the impacts of the community, the environmental impacts, and other items that I won't get into. Um, but we're hoping to kick this project off soon. Um, once we start it, it'll be roughly about a 12 to 14 month project. Um, and the project is currently fully funded by Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fees, or TUMF um, fees. 
Um, once completed, our next step will be to move forward with preliminary engineering and environmental analysis. And this is, this is a great project, although it's a long-term project. Um, there's a lot of analysis that goes into it. There's a lot of design and review that goes into it. Um, and so um, this is, although we're starting it now, it's, it's something that's not going to happen overnight. So patience will be uh, very key in this project. Another uh, highly anticipated project is the Sun Lakes Boulevard Extension. Um, with uh, our community development director's assistant, Adam Rush, um, we've kicked off the, an amendment to our general plan to realign the Sun Lakes Boulevard extension as it's shown in our circulation element to meet um, a, an existing alignment of right-of-way that, that the city of Banning owns. Um, prior, or, or I shouldn't say prior, the, the current alignment is an actual S-shape from the intersection of Sun Lakes Boulevard and Highland Home Road to a connection point of Lincoln and Sunset. Um, one of our biggest challenges with that project is, uh, is acquiring the right-of-way. And so we've tried to acquire the right-of-way over, over the last couple of years. There were several obstacles, and we said, hey, you know what? We'd be better off realigning this project. And so the general plan amendment has been kicked off. We're expecting to have that done February of uh, this upcoming year. And as soon as that's done, we're going to move into preliminary engineering and environmental. And so um, both of those phases are fully funded, um, and we're hoping to uh, get started with that uh, project a lot faster than, than the Highland Springs Interchange Project. Um, we've modeled this project, and, and it's notable that this project alone will assist in the congestion and relieving the congestion at the Highland Springs project. And so it's uh, something that we have on our, uh, high on our priority and that we'll continue moving forward with. Um, and the I-10 bypass project, I just want to quickly mention this. This is not a city project, um, but I thought that it would be worth mentioning that the I-10 uh, bypass project just completed its second public comment period um, of its draft EIR. That comment period ended September 25th. Um, there were several comments that were submitted, is my understanding. The city of Banning had a list of comments that, uh, that it provided to the county, who is the lead on this project. Um, but, but more important to note, the county has narrowed this project down to two alternatives. Both, both of those alternatives start in the same place and they end in the same place, um, which is uh, in Banning, which is what we're concerned about, is the connection of, uh, or sorry, the intersection of Hathaway and Westward. And so again, although this is not a city of Banning project, it is a project that we'll be closely tracking as it does impact um, the, the traffic and, and, and uh, the community members that live near that intersection. Uh, past transit. Several of you could, uh, are familiar with our past transit system, which is our local um, transit system. Um, we are going through a rebranding effort at the moment, um, um, and so is the city of Beaumont, who is our, our co-partner of past transit. Um, we have uh, selected a, a new um, brand, which will be pa the Banning Connect Transit System, um, and so we're hoping to roll this new logo out to the public, um, hopefully June of this upcoming year. There's been a lot of tra changes in transit. Um, we have seen our ridership numbers uh, increase over the last uh, two months. Um, compared to the previous year, we've seen an average of about a 30% increase, which is really good for that, uh, for that division. Um, we're soon going to roll out an electronic fare uh, purchasing um, application that you can now buy your bus passes on, on, on your phone. Um, this is nothing new. There's several agencies that have it, but we're excited to bring, um, bring this to, uh, to our ridership. Um, we're also, with our rebranding process, we're going to create an advertising program. So if there's uh, business uh, members out there, if you're interested in advertising on the exterior interior of our buses or bus stops, um, please look, uh, look uh, towards a, a program that we're going to roll out here in the next few months. Um, and lastly, we'll be a real-time plat platform for our customers and operators. And with this, with this real-time platform, which is essentially another mobile application, our riders will be able to know exactly where their bus is at, and then they'll have a very accurate estimate of when that bus is going to arrive. We take several calls every day of, hey, where's my bus? I've been waiting here for a while, so we're hoping to limit those calls with this platform. But just as critical, this platform is going to be able to collect the data that we need to make data-driven decisions to enhance our, our, our service that we provide and also uh, to make sure that our operations are running efficiently. And so we look forward to rolling that out as well. On the, uh, on the water side, um, we are very excited about the, um, kicking off our advanced metering infrastructure project. Um, we're hoping to begin the installation of our first couple of meters uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we plan on replacing over 10,000 meters, and we're going to do that in-house. So we're expecting this is going to take about two years to complete. Um, the project includes in, in the, um, 
uh, installing collectors out on poles that were going to collect the data from the meters, um, 10,000 meters in chains that I had mentioned. And, and as, we, as we progress through this project, we're going to have a customer portal. We're going to roll out a customer portal for our customers to be able to log into their accounts and get um, past and current usage history. And, and also what's going to help our customers um, save on money will be that if you have a leak, this system will be able to detect you or tell you, either alert you via text or an email saying, hey, you have a leak or you have some issue that's showing a very high usage on your meter. Right now, what, what happens is that if you have a leak on your system behind the meter, it could take two, three months before you realize you have it because you're noticing, hey, my bills are starting to go up. Something's not, not right here. And this will identify it immediately and be able to alert our customers. Not only saving our customers money, but assuring that we're using our water in a very responsible way. Um, and it's worth mentioning that, that this, uh, this project is partially funded by a $300,000 grant that we got through uh, the Bureau of Reclamation. There's several other grants out there that we've identified that we're also going to be um, seeking funds from to try to um, help, that, uh, help that project out. Uh, I, I wanted to talk quickly about water supply versus demand. Um, I received several questions and complaints about, um, normally around like, hey, why are you making me conserve water, but we're approving all these development projects? I'm sure there might be even some of you out there that asked me that question. Um, we went through a couple of years of a drought, and, and I consider that for us, like many other water agencies out there, consider that a regulatory drought. We, we've Com, um, consistently operated within what's called our safe field. Our safe field is essentially the amount of water that we can pull out of the ground safely without putting our aquifer system in, in an overdraft state. Um, but we were still required to meet the state's, the state's regulations. And so that's why all of our customers got notices that we had to save water. There were conservation goals that were put out by the state. And, and I only can applaud our customer base because we were able to meet that, uh, that goal. And, and for, for us, I believe it was a 28% reduction uh, from the previous years. And so just to kick around a, a couple of numbers, and, and again, I'll mention that 100% of our water here in Banning comes from the ground. It's, it's all well-produced water. Um, our, our local safe yield is 9,675 acre feet per year. So again, that's the amount of water that we can pull out of the ground safely without putting our, our aquifer system in overdraft. In 2018, our demand was 7,934 um, acre feet for that year. And, and so as you can see, we're well within our safe yield. And that number, that, that 9,675 acre feet per year allotment, that doesn't account for 52,000 acre feet of water that we have stored in the Beaumont Basin. That also doesn't account for 1,845 acre feet per year, which is an average of what we get put into our storage account um, related to our appropriative water right in the Beaumont Basin. And I won't get into that, but if you, I'm happy if you guys have questions later, I can explain the appropriative right to you. And I just wanted to highlight this because there is confusion out there that we, that we don't have water, that we don't have water for future development, but in fact we do. And key to this, and key to meeting our future build-out demands is going to be um, recycled water. Recycled water is going to offset some of those existing potable irrigation demands. And so the outlook is only going to be better once we start delivering recycled water, which is a perfect segue into water reclamation, planning for the future. Um, our wastewater treatment plant is a gem. You've got to be a certain level of nerd to call a wastewater treatment plant a gem. And I believe it's level 100, which I, I'm pretty sure I'm getting close to that. But, it, but our wastewater treatment plant is a gem. It's a very old wastewater treatment plant, and it's very cost effective. It meets all of our regulations. Um, but unfortunately, it's not keeping up with some of our regulatory requirements that are constantly changing. And so this last year, we, we took a, a in-depth evaluation of that existing facility to determine what type of improvements we're gonna need to meet some of these ever-changing regulations. Um, recycled water is constantly on our mind. We've, we've uh, um, over the last decade, we slowed down on, the, on, um, on moving forward with the development of, a, of what's called Title 22 recycled water, only because at the time we didn't need it. You know, a, a lot of people say, well, why, let's just move forward, it makes sense. It does to meet future demands, but it doesn't right now because our existing customer base didn't need, doesn't need recycled water. If, if we would have built this facility a decade ago, then all of our existing customers would have been paying for that and we really don't need it. But it is needed for the future and it's something that we're proactively planning for. Um, 
we recently completed a, a, um, an analysis of several different technologies that are out there and available to produce recycled water. We created a short list and we're currently developing an implementation um, project or process to, to try to stage, um, stage these improvements out. So in order to minimize that, cap, that upfront capital um, hit to, uh, to our customers. And so that'll be coming uh, in the near future. And, and I want to end uh, my presentation with development impact fees because this ties, uh, uh, ties closely with the reliability of our infrastructure. Development impact fees, the last time the city had updated our development impact, fee, impact fees was 2006. Our city council just approved the, the, uh, the new update of them. And development impact fees for our city is very, very important. Um, this, is, this is a program that is going to assure that we're generating the revenue that we need to mitigate the impacts of future development. And that is key because we have to make sure that we have the streets, that we have the water system, we have the wastewater system, that we have fire, that we have facilities for our, for our police department, that we have all those facilities as we grow. And so I thank City Council and I applaud the City Manager for the support in trying to get this program out, which we have in place just in time for all this growth that we're gonna see. And so with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it, I'll be around if you have any questions. So as mentioned, my name is Adam Rush. I'm the Community Development Director. I'm also uh, fairly new. I've been here about six months. Been in the industry about 15 years. I've done private and public sector. So kind of have a, a range of uh, everything. Uh, we get to be involved before public works and before electric utilities. So who are our customers? They're the business owners. If you're looking to expand your business, do a tenant improvement add-on to your business or your house, uh, develop a large piece of property like the Diversify Pacific or Part D projects that we've been talking about. Uh, do a, you know, add something else to your business, uh, process a liquor license, all those types of things, they come to us. So the community development department, we get to do kind of all the fun stuff uh, before all the engineers get in and mess it up. I mean, make it better. So uh, that's kind of what we do. Uh, I do all the planning and the building, so we cover building services, building permits, everything from a roof permit to 500 single family dwellings and, and all of that. Uh, we've talked a lot about these before, just go through them kind of briefly. The uh, Atwell Party project has broken ground, you've probably seen that and it's been mentioned we're expecting several hundred permits. Uh, when I first got into the city I asked what permitting system we use and I was told we don't use a permitting system. So. We do have one, but it's, it's not as robust as it needs to be to handle this level of development. When you're going from processing seven to six to seven building permits in several years to hundreds in a year, it is going to be a, a huge change for not only the city, but the city staff that hasn't had that level of development. So uh, we're, I'll get to that in the next slide, but we're getting ready for that. And then the Rancho San Gregorio development uh, is, I would say about, they might, you know, give me glares here, but about 12 to 18 months behind where Part D is right now. So we have about 8,000 units on the horizon. If you look roughly at, you know, 2.5, 2.6 people per house, that's a significant, that's almost doubling the population of, of the city in the next 10 to 15 years. So I talked about permitting and those permits. Uh, we have invested heavily, and this is not permit money, this is not development money, uh, this is one-time grant money that we are using to purchase a very robust permitting system to be able to handle all of this activity coming in. To be able to track all the permits, to be able to assess them and make sure that is done efficiently and effectively. So we're rolling this out. Uh, it was a little bit delayed, unfortunately, due to some uh, just, you know, contractual issues on, on the vendor's part, but we're getting moving. I'm hoping to have this done by spring of next year, so if you come in, uh, you won't even have to come into the office. And if you do, uh, a lot of my staff is here, but just say an S name and you'll get you know, someone to help you. Because we have a Sandra, Sandra, Sonia, and a Sylvia. <laughs> we did have a Sandra, Sandra, Sonia, and a Sandy, and then we replace an S with an S. So just go something and you'll have someone up there to help you. Uh, but we are there Monday through Friday, eight to five. We do permit inspections. About, start about 7.30 to about five, 5.30, uh, and we have the front counter open for all of your all of your needs so I get the fun part of talking about pot um, so I think I have 
the best, je best jobs. Uh, Mary Jane, reefer, cannabis, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Bom or, excuse me, Bandy, Beaumont's a no-pot city. We are uh, a, a good pot city, so we have a <laughs> cannabis program in the city. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard about it before. It's getting a little bit slow rolling. We had to do a lottery, and that was a little bit complicated. Um, it was a very odd process going through that uh, as well. But we had 25 applicants apply. We disqualified one. We had 24. We picked the top three. So the, the ballot measure and the code says one retail cannabis. So that's the dispensaries where you walk in and everything's, you know, there. So I've heard from friends. Uh, <laughs> per 10,000 population. So when we hit 40, then potentially you can have another one. But that's where the three came from. I get a lot of questions on that. It's not just three, it's one per 10,000. So we had the lottery, we uh, chose the top three winners. One is currently in process, they filed this week. Uh, my goal is to have that completed by the end of the year. That particular location is at the southeast corner of Sunset Ramsey, so I've heard it called Citibank, Deutsche Bank, there's a vacant bank building, that's the facility that that uh, retailer is going into. And then the two others have not yet uh, submitted their retail permits. And then we also have a, a commercial, or an I like to call it industrial cannabis program, so that's not the retail centers, that's the growing and the cultivation. Uh, there's no restriction on the number, but they are in a particular zone, and we have one under review right now. The council did take an action between April and, and June to eliminate the setback, and basically it just defaults back to what the setback is in the zone. So it's all the industrial property, and the one in process right now is at the south uh, southwest corner of 8th and Lincoln, just off the freeway. So we got two going in right now. Um, we're hopeful that more will come in in the future, and, and we're tracking that, uh, tracking that very, very closely. And then this has been talked about a lot. I just want to show you some pretty pictures. Uh, the downtown plan I was put in charge when I, I took over uh, the department for the downtown ad hoc committee. So. A lot of different things have kind of been thrown into that and we're you know, sorting through and looking at the priorities. Uh, these are kind of some of the, the initial uh, wins that we've, we've had. We don't see anything out there right now, right now excuse me, but uh, we are taking a roadway adoption program to the city council on the 22nd. So that would be like Kiwanis or Key Club or the Chamber or whoever wants to adopt a segment. You pick up the trash, you trim the landscaping, you know, kind of general maintenance. That's your road segment for as long as you do that. So we're starting that program. You may have seen the signs on the, on the freeway. We are uh, starting a, we're restarting the mural program. We have uh, two fellows in the back, uh, Andrea and Douglas. The good thing about fellows is we don't have to pay them. They get paid by someone else. And uh, they're working on the mural program as well as some healthy communities uh, aspects as well. We're looking to do an alley repavement and activation process. So if you've been to like San Luis Obispo or Pismo or uh, Redlands, we'll kind of activate those alleys, make them usable space and, and use them for something other than being a, you know, being a, a potentially unsafe uh, situation. And then uh, landscaping and beautification projects as well. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So, as you can imagine, we have a lot of fun with the discussions around cannabis, um, and sometimes we ingest, make make a little bit of fun of our neighbors in Beaumont. <laughs> Their hashtag is City Elevated. So you can imagine some of the things we came up with. Well, how can we how can we one up that? We're higher than you didn't seem to work. <laughs> but a Adam, actually, Adam actually introduced a, a, a new, new thing we might pursue when he was talking about our cannabis program was slow rolling. No. So we're, we're going to have some fun with that. A as a management team, we, we do like to have fun. And um, our newest, newest team member, is Ralph Wright. He's our Parks and Recreation Director. And I think it was within a few hours, and, and maybe even before Ralph actually joined us, that the management team had already given him a nickname. <laughs> Let me introduce to you Wreck It Ralph. 
Well, hello. As I said, I'm uh, three weeks in. So excited to be here in Banning and be here today. With that, I'm going to talk about parks and recreation and what we do and uh, a little bit about that. Creating community. What we do is we provide opportunities to create community and memories for our citizens through our parks and programs. And I'll tell you a little bit how we do that. We have, first off, a really amazing and dedicated staff. A couple are here today. Got in the back Scott Foster and Anna Sandoval. They've got to deal with me every second with questions of how we do stuff, so that's kind of fun for them. But how we do it is we provide these services and these opportunities. We have parks. We have six parks with both passive and active amenities throughout. And we provide a great deal of programming, and we're going to continue to expand on that um, in the upcoming years. I'm going to talk a little bit about the programming we have really quick. Uh, recreation side, we have youth sports programs that are both city operated, and then we assist with parent-led groups like Little League and some soccer organizations. Between the two, we almost have a thousand participants in our youth sports programs using our city fields. We have a day camp program that runs in the summer that has over 50 participants throughout the nine-week session. We also have a lot of contract classes like karate, ballet and tap, and just other classes to give opportunities out there for our citizens. Our aquatics program operates in the summer. It has um, water exercise classes, lap swim program, open rec swim. Uh, we had over 12,000 participants this season come to our open rec swim. And then we had 400 plus kids participate in our learn to swim program, which is a very important program for a community. Next, talking about the dedicated staff. We have a senior center and senior services provided there in Banning, and the staff is amazing. They treat and consider all the seniors in that program as family, and it's noticeable when you walk in there from the interactions, and it's just, it's an amazing place to go and visit all the time. We have up to 60 daily participants into the facility. We give out 9,000 warm, well-balanced meals last year. And then we have items like we have a food pantry called uh, Fill the Cupboard that's actually supported by the Sun Lakes Charitable Foundation, which we thank very much. Uh, we gave out 375 bags of food to those in need this past year. On top of that, we have a lot of other activities for fun with bus trips. We have um, contract classes, Fit After 50 exercise programs, Tai Chi, those kind of programs. So it's an amazing uh, place to be and uh, it's expanding every day. And then we have other opportunities in the creating a larger scale community, and it's our events. We have city special events. On the upcoming two weeks, we have our Halloween Fest, which will have a trunk or treat. It'll have a kind of a carnival type atmosphere with vendor booths, costume contests, Halloween, Halloween themed events. So it's really exciting. We have an awesome event, a Santa shop. It's in uh, December partnership with the Kiwanis Club and it provides an opportunity for children to purchase small gifts for siblings and their parents and have them wrapped for Christmas. It's a great program. And then we're partners for the Christmas at the Ranch event. We have as part of the healthy uh, communities offerings, we have a 5k run looking to expand on that. And then we have a health fair that we run and then a big 4th of, uh, of July event. On top of that, we support signature community events. We partner or help uh, community groups here with our disaster preparedness event, the evening concert series in, in August for the Playhouse Bowl, and with Stagecoach Days. And the city pr uh, participates financially and participates with in-kind services with staff help and city uh, involvement throughout the process. And then quickly, on the horizon, where we're going to go. We have a number of improvement projects coming up, hopefully, in the future with our parks. Uh, mentioned earlier through the CDBG funding or Community Development Block Grant. 
We have a fencing project at Dysart Park that's hopefully in the next two months we'll be getting going. We have um, improvements to our playgrounds, replacement of equipment at Replier, at Lyons, and at Sylvan that's coming up shortly. Uh, we have also put in for a grant for an expansion at Lyons Park, and we're excited that hopefully in December we'll be awarded a state grant that'll help expand, add some multi-use fields to the park there, some extra parking and some restroom facilities. It's a great improvement having some soccer opportunities there. And then we've put in some other CDBG grants uh, recently for a replacement of a playground at Richard Sanchez Park, and then um, an improvement grant for rehabilitation in Replier Park with improvements in the bathrooms, drinking fountains, and the amenities throughout, just to try to make the park better. We're also looking for, uh, in the planning stages, for a camera system idea throughout the parks area to improve the design and safety there for our parks. And then lastly, um, on a consistent basis, but something we're really going to work on, the department was community services and it's transitioned to parks and recreation as where we're at now. And we'll be working on a rebranding in the upcoming year and then on a continuous basis, but that'll be evaluating our programs, that'll be uh, conducting surveys involving the citizenship, making sure that we're provided what's wanted and needed in our community. And like I said, three weeks, but I'm excited to be here and look forward to the upcoming year. I know it's been long, and I promise to keep it as short as possible. Uh, I, I want to say, as we start talking about uh, staffing levels and different things, we're going to talk about the police department. I want to just start, yeah, with perception and understand what things go on. I say, we live in a world today of policing where we look at something and we think it's one way, and a year or two later we find out the rest. And I, and I talk about this because... Uh, my wife has always stayed in good shape, as have my children. I obviously have eaten too many donuts, and so one day I come home from a workout center and I sit down and I'm sweaty, and my little girl, who's now 22, she walks in, she's about five years old, and I said, Kimmy, one day I'm gonna be skinny just like you. She goes, but Daddy, I wanna be chubby just like you. She goes, if I work out, can I get chubby? And I thought, about that for a minute. Why did she believe that if you left the house to go exercise, you got over, you became overweight? Because I was the only one that left the house to work out, and I was the over, only overweight guy. <laughs> and so her perception, she was absolutely convinced that if you leave the house and go exercise, you're coming back chubby. She knows it. <laughs> That's her mind, but I think sometimes we do that too when we look at perceptions and see things. A little bit about me, I came, I spent 23 years in Indianapolis. And then the same size as San Francisco. And actually in 2013, it was larger than San Francisco. So it was a big city. We had about 155 murders a year. And that's where I raised my family there, all, all my seven children and I. And left there, we went to Bainbridge, and they hadn't had a murder in 20 years. And so just opposite. And here, Banning, which in between there, we got a little bit of crime going on. So we're going to talk about how, what we're going to do here to help reduce that and how we're working together. And most importantly is it's a relationship. So... I want to recognize, because I'm going to get talking here just for about five minutes, Art Chacon, who is my new supervisor for a code enforcement, is back there. <laughs> Art has been with the city of Banning how many years, Art? Uh, 14. 14 years. And then Diane, right behind him, is one of our new code enforcement officers that was approved by uh, <laughs> Diane Serrano. And she has hit the road running. She's, she's great. And of course, my first promotion when I got here, because that's one of the good things the chief gets to do, was Sol Avila, who is my executive secretary, executive assistant. And she's phenomenal, works circles around all of us. And then Captain Holder, uh, my number two, go ahead, you can stand up too, Captain. He thinks he doesn't have to stand up because he's retiring. I don't know if I should announce, but he, he's gone here a little while, so he's kind of, yeah, whatever the chief says, whatever. But uh, no, he, he's been absolutely phenomenal in help getting our new, uh, not new policy, but updated policy. So there's a lot of things we have to do. A lot of laws have been passed here in this state that uh, concern how we conduct our business, and that's what we're having to comply with, and there's a lot of work involved in that. So, um, so I've spent, I just hit my, started my 30th year here this past week in law enforcement. 
And I was only supposed to be here five years. That was the first lie I told my wife. Um, and she hadn't forgotten it. So staffing level in, Bainbr or in uh, Banning, sorry. We, in America, we have 2.4 officers per 1,000 people. That's the national average. In the state of California, it's 2.5 per 1,000. So if we have 31,000 people, we should have you know, 2.5 times 31. Well, we have 31 officers, so we have one per 1,000. That's what we here have here in Banning. And I'm, I'm grateful. If we can get them all hired, that's going to be great. I still have four open positions, and there are four that I've hired for. Only two have actually hit the street, so I've got two that aren't because it takes so long to get them to the point they're on the street. So we're actually down six, but only four to hire. And we've got 16 applicants next week coming in for interviews. And we've actually hired back somebody who left during uh, a tough time for the department, has decided he wanted to come back because things had changed and got better. And so I hired him back, and he's a great addition. I'm glad to have him back. So Banning sits at uh, authorized strength of 31. We're at 27, but, and then there are for the four others. So we're, we're really down about seven. Um, so when I first got here, we had uh, two officers uh, were in the process of resigning, six open positions, six officers were out on injury or marked off. So we had total officers working 17, so we had a half officer per thousand. So understand the challenge there. The national average is 2.4 per thousand. When I got here, we were at 0.54 per thousand for those that were on the street. It was, it was pretty tough, but we're a lot better today. So we have uh, five hires, like I said, working in the process. This leaves us three opening, 16 interviews next week. We've hired our police records assistant. We've promoted Seoul. We hired a, another dispatcher, now we've got to hire another one. Uh, so we're trying to keep those, what, what happened in the past is a lot of these vacancies stayed vacant for a long time and it leads to issues. We're doing reactive policing. Everyone talks about predictive policing or hotspot policing. Well, that's all proactive principles. If, if you don't have the, if all you have your officers doing is taking runs, then you just have a reactive police part. There's no proactive work going on and we've got to get to that to reduce crime. Um, so when full staffing is achieved, which should be in the next six months, uh, we will have, we're working on homeless. We have an officer back who's worked on that and he's done a very good job. In fact, in this very room, I think it was this room here at Sun Lakes, he was given officer of the year. Officer Sieski does a great job working with our homeless, so work on that. It's one of the biggest complaints I get here, I've got since I've been here in Banning. Uh, we're starting a top 10 offenders list, more traffic enforcement, parole and probation sweeps, and a gang initiative, we've got one of our detectives assigned to the GIT team, works with the DA. They have uh, the gang impact team. Uh, we have a significant issue here with that. So we have her working in that unit that helps us uh, liaison with the GIT team. Um, since June, our homeless initiative, we've kicked off. We've uh, recovered 151 shopping carts. 16 transient camps were dismantled. Approximately 14 arrests, and those are for warrants and things like that, not just going out and arresting, running checks and finding out they've got warrants. Uh, numerous truckloads of garbage have been removed, and uh, every single homeless person that we meet, and, and when we dismount things, they will offer them all the social services that are available in Riverside County. And, and whether you understand this or not, 99% of the time they do not take us up on any of the offers for social services. They just don't. So we, the homeless efforts, we do one sweep a month and we target, anytime someone calls in and says, hey, we've got this camp that's been built up, we need help with, uh, that's what we focus on. And the sites come from either citizens, businesses, or city staff. We talked about code enforcement. We've doubled the number of code enforcement officers to, from two to four to work with uh, the marijuana dispensaries, weed abatement, trash and abandoned cars, and other things that are eyesores for our city we want to clean up. Uh, improvements we've made. So when I got here, there's been things that hadn't been done for, well, Art will tell you, we just had a meeting over our fleet for police, uh, police cars and said, we haven't sat down and had a meeting like this in, in six to seven years or seven to eight years, something like that. Those are the kinds of relationships that we really have to work together. Uh, I work with Beaumont, Sean, uh, the chief over there, uh, Sheriff Bianco in the Sheriff's Department, their newly elected sheriff. We're working together to try to get things done collaboratively because Bad guys don't know boundaries. They don't care. 
And, and, if we, and if we're not working together, we're not going to solve the problem. Culture in the police department, we're talking about routine staff meetings, all hands meetings. They haven't had those, the two or three that we've had, been how long since we've had them, Captain? It's been... 14 years. To me, that's a, that's a travesty. You've got to meet and come together and talk about what things we're going to get done and coordinate if we're not doing that. Um, individual meetings, a culture change and how to treat each other. We talk about Officer Brian Walker's rehired. He wanted to come back. And the awards that our officers have received. Our officers do terrific work. I will tell you, and I, I will recount an experience just in the last 30 days. Captain, you can correct me. You're retiring, so you don't care if you embarrass me. Um, <laughs> We had a subject that uh, had stabbed a couple people, yes. and they cornered him, yes. and uh, he still had the knife in his hand, and we were able to use less lethal rounds and uh, other means to take him into custody without having to uh, use deadly force. And to me, uh, what they were able to do that night is just incredible. It was a dangerous, dangerous situation where like I said, we had people that were stabbed here in the city by this individual. We were able to take him into custody. Uh, and the, the manner in which we did it, I, I think, is extremely commendable. So it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago we had another guy run at one of our officers with a knife and was stabbing the hood of his police car. And he had to back down the street to get away from him because he was just stabbing him into the police car. So we talk about, yes, cleaning up trash and homeless. But I want you to know what my officers are facing every day when they go out here. And these things, I've only been here eight months, and that's just two of the things I can remember in my mind. We, we've had other things occurring. So I, I want you to realize they work, they are incredible. I, I really am happy with the staff that we have and, and the work that they're doing and performing as an understaffed unit. So uh, people always, you know, when they talk about crime, they don't really talk about thefts, or, you know, the big one is, is murder. So, uh, this slide is, is uh, not up to date. We recently had our second murder of the year, but if you look at the last few years, in 2014 we had one, 2015 we had eight, 2016 three, 17 four, and 18 we had six. The national average for solving uh, homicides, murders in this country is around high 50%. In 2018, just the previous year, we solved five out of six which puts us about 83%, so we're w much higher than the national average in solving homicides on a staff that is much lower than most other cities in this country. So hats off to the, to the officers here that you have. <laughs> and I told you I'd be quick, and so if I went on any longer, I'd lie, so I can't do that. <laughs> so th thank you. And the other thing, I want to tell each and every one of you, my door is always open. You have a question, you have a concern, you don't like how we do something, you like how we do something, we like to hear that too. But if you don't like, come see me. My door's always open, I will meet with you and talk to you and we'll try to solve these problems together. And thank you for the outpouring of support I've received since I've been here. Manny's incredible, I'm glad I made the, the move. My wife is extremely happy because now we get sunshine most of the year, not two months out of the year. Short speech, five minutes. So now it's my turn to give you the full story. So settle back, it's only going to take another 30 minutes. <laughs> Just joking. I want to say to all of you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming today and showing the interest in your city, in the Pass area, and in Riverside County. What I really want to do now, though, is thank the gentleman who spearheaded this meeting and put this together, our city manager, Doug Schultz. I think, I hope, all of you get the thought, the idea, that we have an incredible staff working for all of us in the city of Banning. I would like for all of the staff present today to please stand so we could say thank you. Come on, all of you.
Thank you. That was instead of a raise. <laughs> anyway, thank all of you for being part of this. Banning is trying very, very hard through your elected officials and the staff of this city to be as transparent and to be as cooperative and effective in helping our city succeed. Have a good day.